neighbors, our blood is one. And children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. come on. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up, I don't fear no evil Just fix your eyes on this one truth That God is madly in love with you Take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where our help comes from
Welcome, church, to Easter at Compass. We are so glad that you decided to join us. Um, if you've been around here for any amount of time, you know that life change and redemption is something that we're very passionate about. So up here on the screen, we're gonna show some pictures of people who've been baptized these last couple weeks. Come on, let's celebrate. These are people who've decided to put their identity in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's just continue to worship our risen King this Easter morning.
serve a God who, he's gonna get to us. He loves us so much that he does what it has to be, what had to be done to get to us. Come on, let's sing this together. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. And you have been so, so kind. To me. Come on, sing it out. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, it says, So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. You may be seated. You know, the amazing part about that story is it describes a heavenly father, our God that we serve, who is in relentless pursuit of us in relationship. And once he seeks us and finds us, he rejoices over that. And that's what we remember when we enter into this time of communion together, that we serve a God who pursues us, so much so that he sent Jesus into this world to sacrifice his life for us on the cross. Jesus himself, when he talked about what communion meant to his disciples said, when you take this bread, it represents my body that gives new life for you. And then when you dip it in the cup, it represents 
the blood that I'm gonna pour out on the cross that covers over all of your sins and it confirms that new covenant between God and us. And so today, as, as we take communion together, if you're a follower of Christ, we wanna invite you to take it together as, as one family to proclaim the death of Jesus. And the way we do it here is we're gonna pass the trays and you take that bread and, and you dip it in the juice and, and you take communion, thinking about Jesus' sacrifice and then pass it to your neighbor. And then just spend some meaningful moments in prayer, thanking him for the sacrifice that he made. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we thank you so much for this time where we can stop and remember that amazing sacrifice that Jesus made. Father, we're so thankful for it. We're so thankful for you that you pursue us in relationship, even if we were just one. God, that you would come after us and you rejoice over us. So God, thank you for that. And right now, help us to, to really focus our thoughts and our heart on that. We pray these things in Jesus' good name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing this together. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow.
Awesome. Well, it's Easter at Compass. Man, I'm glad you're here. And Easter is all those things for sure. Hey, we're so excited that you've joined us this morning. If you're a guest, we especially want to welcome you. Uh, we spent some time over the last couple days uh, walking this worship center. Uh, we've walked through with our volunteers and our staff, uh, uh, lots and lots of people. Every row, we prayed over every seat. Now, we weren't praying over those seats that a person would fill those seats. We were praying for the person that would be sitting in those seats. And so if you're a guest and you're here today, you're an answer to our prayers for sure, uh, the fact that you've joined us today. And we prayed for you that God would meet you where you are, that you would sense his, his love and his presence in a tangible way, that he would speak to your heart. And we pray that, that when you leave here today, all those things are true. So thanks for coming. Uh, we also would love to connect with you. Uh, we got a new here card in the, in the seat in front of you. And if you'll fill that out, we've got this cozy place called the living room in our lobby. Uh, right over to the left as you walk out, we kind of set up this cool living room so that you'd feel right at home. And uh, we've got volunteers and staff in there that can answer any of the questions you have about Compass. Uh, we can help you get connected. We would also love to give you a gift before you leave. And it may or may not have something to do with a Starbucks, gift card, stuff like that. Uh, it's not a cheesy gift. It's a good gift. So I hope you'll stop by the living room after service and let us just get to know you a little better. So today we are talking about hope. Uh, years ago, there was a story about Billy Graham having a visit with Winston Churchill. And Churchill was in one of his melancholy moods, and so when Billy Graham walked into the room, he simply greeted him with a question, young man, do you have any hope? Well, I want to start today by asking you the same question. Do you have any hope? I mean, school teachers, do you have any hope? Do you feel like our schools are getting better? Or are you frustrated that they're not as safe as they should be and, and that students are undisciplined and that their parents just don't seem to care? Business leaders, do you feel like America will eventually balance the budget and that we will move forward into a fiscally sound future? Or do you think that it's just a matter of time before the national debt actually comes due and we go bankrupt? I want to ask you, reporters, do you have any hope? Do you see America getting better? Do you see race relations improving? Uh, do you see us moving into a promising future here in America? Or do you feel like we might just be a seething cauldron waiting to bubble over? Counselors, do you see the family getting stronger, more stable here in America? Or do you sense, as I do, that there's an increasing amount of abuse and abandonment and neglect and divorce? Dennis Waitley, Dr. Dennis Waitley says, the real story of our day is that chaos is the normal order of things. You know, you look around our world, it doesn't feel like there's much hope. In fact, someone has said you can live for about four weeks without food, and, and you can live for about uh, four days without water, and you can live for about four minutes without air, but you can't even live four seconds without hope. And so that's why I want to talk to you today about the hope we have as Christians because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're here and you're a guest and you're just trying to figure out this Jesus thing, first of all, man, you're in a safe place. I'm excited you're here today. That's awesome. Thanks for trusting us. And you might be wondering, though, why do you get so fired up every year about this resurrection thing? Well, we actually get fired up more than just once a year about the resurrection thing. But the reason we do, let me tell you, is because the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the core truth of the Christian faith. In fact, one of the verses we're going to look at today says, If Christ has not been raised, your preaching is useless and so is your faith. And what that means is, if Jesus has not raised from the dead, then, then man, our faith is just some well-constructed myth developed to make people feel better, but it's not a life-changing truth. It's not a life-changing reality because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead and he was just a man like the rest of us, he may have been wise and he may have been good and he may have been influential, but if he wasn't who he claimed to be, the Son of God, then he's not worthy of our worship. On the other hand, if Jesus did rise from the dead, then that means he was God in a human body. And he's worthy of our worship and our service and our respect and our obedience because everything he said about life and death and eternity is true. And friends, if Jesus did in fact pull off Easter, you don't want to be on the wrong side of anything he said, right? And so that's why this is such a big deal. The resurrection changes everything. 
Years ago, a, a man's wife died and was resuscitated in a very unusual way. Uh, the pallbearers uh, were carrying her casket into the, cemetery, uh, into the cemetery, and one of the pallbearers stumbled on a rock, and it shook the casket in such a way that she was revived and lived for seven more years. Now, seven years later, she died again. And this time, on the way to the cemetery, when they came to that same spot in the path, her husband shouted, watch out for that rock! <laughs> now, friends, I, I sincerely doubt the validity of that story. <laughs> and yet our hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the validity of those facts in history are absolutely true. In fact, I want to take us to a Bible passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, uh, one of the things we love to do here at Compass is just give you a Bible, give Bibles away. And so if you don't have one and you'd like one, we want to have the Word of God in your hands. And if you want one after service, come find me in the lobby near the living room and, and I'll make sure you get one. It'll be my Easter gift to you, okay, along with that Starbucks gift card. But I'd love to give you a Bible, okay? So 1 Corinthians 15, in order to understand the hope of the resurrection and the good news that we have, you have to kind of understand some of the bad news first. So can you hang with me? Can we dig in together? Let's do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and here's what he says starting in verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. So Paul says, hey, listen, out of all the things I've ever preached to you, this is the most important thing. And then he reminds them of what that is. Here's what he says. That Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. Now move on down to verse 50. Paul says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, he said, listen, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. So that's his metaphor for death. Before Jesus comes back and when he comes back, we will not all have, have died and gone on, Right? We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, friends, speaking of labor... I want you to imagine as we start today, two women. And let's imagine that these two women have the exact same job. And every day, these two women perform exactly the same menial tasks. And let's imagine that these two women, every single day, they, they have absolutely the same hard working conditions. And, and they do exactly the same job every day. But let's imagine that for one of these women, for her year's worth of work, she gets paid $15,000, only $15,000 for the year. Let's imagine, though, that the other woman, she gets paid $15 million for her work. Now, we know something automatically, don't we? We know that these two women are going to be looking at their work differently. And they're both going to be looking at their work not based on their present circumstances, right? 
but what they believe their ultimate future to be. Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. And if you want a book that kind of gives you the cultural synopsis of of how the Christian church came into being and, and how Christians triumphed in the Roman Empire, this is the book. And basically he says there are three major differences between Christians and their worldview and the pagan neighbors that lived around them in that day. And let me tell you what those three are. He says one is when the great epidemics hit the urban centers of the Greco-Roman world, while most people just said, I'm going to get out of Dodge, I'm going to flee the city, Christians stayed behind in the cities and took care of the sick, even though in many cases they died doing so. Secondly, he says, when Christians were persecuted, and that is, in that day, they were put to death unjustly because of their faith, they did not respond with terrorism, They did not respond in violent retaliation, but they actually died praying for the forgiveness of their enemies. Third, Stark says at the height of the Roman Empire, Rome had basically conquered all the nations in that part of the world. That had never been done before in history. And so what we see here is that for the first time really in history in that part of the world, all the national borders were open. That's because those nations weren't against each other. They were actually all subjugated to Rome. And so for the first time in history, the cities of the Roman Empire had become completely multi-ethnic. That had never happened before. Now in those cities, you might imagine in that day, because that was all new to everyone, there was a lot of racial tension. There was a lot of ethnic tension. And Rodney Stark said that the Christian church was the first institution in history that brought people together across those ethnic barriers. They said, race means nothing. Race isn't important. There's no pecking order of the races and the cultures. Everybody's welcome in this community. No institution had ever done anything like that. Now, why were the Christians so much more compassionate to the sick? And and why were the Christians so much more forgiving of their persecutors? And why were the Christians so much more ethnically inclusive of all those around them? Were they just modern, virtuous people? I mean, did did they just, you know, kind of live ahead of their time? Were they just nicer than everybody else? No. It all depended, friends, on what they believed their ultimate future to be. Their pagan neighbor's understanding of their ultimate future was kind of shrouded in mystery. They didn't have really an understanding of of what would happen after you die and what their future held and and what life after death looked like. They were very uncertain about it. And yet the Christians had hope. The Christians were shaped by a joyous certainty of God's future. Eternal glory, eternal hope, eternal love was in their future. And so the reason they stayed in those cities at risk of their lives and cared for the sick is because they weren't afraid of death. Because they knew that after that comes God's love in heaven forever. And the reason they didn't respond with terrorism and violence was that they believed at the end of time God would judge everything and make everything right. By the way, the Greeks and the Romans had no concept of a final judgment at all. So they they didn't think there even was one. So the Christians did, and they felt like, I don't need to be the judge because God's going to do that one day. Lastly, the pagans believed that every nation had their own God little g. Christians believed that there was one God over all the nations and that he was creating a new community, a new people from every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. And because of that, they welcomed people in. They had a completely different, joyous, life-shaping conviction about their future. And that caused the Christians to live completely differently from the culture around them. Now, You might be saying, well, that sounds very good, Pastor. I appreciate the history lesson today, but how could anybody be certain about their future? I mean, how could those early Christians have been absolutely certain that their future was going to include love and glory forever? Well, friends, the answer, and therefore the key to this whole idea we're talking about today of Christian hope, has to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 holds all those answers about hope and about certainty of the future. So let's look again. Let's go to the Word of God and let's study like we always do here at Compass. I'm only going to give you two points today. So write these down. you got a note sheet so you can take this home and remember it. Here's number one. You ready? Here we go. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gave the early Christians certainty of God's future for them. 
Now, we've already read that, really, in verses 1 through 10, but I want to focus again one more time on verses 3 through 8, and let's try to figure out why they were so certain. Paul said, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And after that, he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. So how does this certainty work? Uh, Why did they believe what they believed? I'm glad you asked that question this morning. (laughs) Because there are three things that we know for sure. This is not speculation This is not some preacher telling you something that's not true. Go to history. There's no debate from anyone in history about this. Here are three things we know for sure. The first thing is that thousands of early people, the Jews and the Greeks that became Christians, they had a worldview revolution overnight. Friends, overnight. Think about that. Overnight, thousands of Jews and Greeks all began to believe something that no worldview, no philosophy had ever allowed for in the history of the world. That a man had been bodily resurrected from the dead and that therefore he had proved he was the son of God. Man, that just didn't compute with anybody. That was crazy. And that happened overnight. It's never happened before, never happened since. Extremely difficult just to brush that away. Hard to account for that. You say, well, well, how in the world did that worldview revolution happen? I mean, how did they change everything they believed overnight? Well, here's the second thing we know, and Paul wrote about it. I just read it to you. There were hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Some said they had one-on-one experiences with Jesus. Others said that, that they saw Jesus, the resurrected Savior, when they were in a small group of people. For some, it happened repeatedly, more than once. And and some, they were in a huge group of 500 people at the same time. There were hundreds and hundreds of people who said, we saw him, we talked to him, we put our fingers in the nail prints in his hands. Friends, we know from credible and undeniable eyewitness accounts over a 40-day period, people talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. Paul talks about it right here, for example, when he says 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, why would he say that at the end? Why would he add that little tagline? Well, he makes a claim that 500 people had seen Jesus all at once. And then he says, hey, if you don't believe me, go ask them. Go find them. Most of those people, the vast majority of them are still living. Go ask them. Some have fallen asleep, but you can just go ask one or two or 10 or 50 of those 500 people what they saw, and they'll tell you, right? You you can't possibly make that kind of statement in a public document only 20 years after an event if it's not true. So first, there is no doubt, friends, that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jews and Greeks said, I saw him, I touched him, I talked to him. That's how Christianity started, And it's been going for 2,000 years. We know this. They said to their relatives and their neighbors and their friends, I know it's crazy. I know it doesn't even make any sense. I know it's not the sort of thing I I would have ever even believed. I mean, it's not even something until it happened I thought could even be possible. But I saw him. I talked to him. We saw it. And as a result, thousands and thousands of people became Christians. Christians. Now, we also know, secondly, that many of those people who were eyewitnesses who saw him died for their faith. So Rodney Stark says in his book, they lived sacrificial lives and they went to their deaths professing they had seen him. Now, here's what I want to say about that. Friends, listen. No one willingly dies for what they know to be a lie. Uh, People will die for things they think are true but really aren't true, right? Right? But no one dies for what they know. No one willingly gives their life, goes to their death for what they know is a lie. That's what he's saying. And yet people went to their deaths. So if you say, I just can't believe it. I can't believe Jesus rose from the dead because my worldview just doesn't allow it. I mean, I'm a scientific person. Those people back then were pretty gullible. Listen, their worldview didn't allow for it either, friends. They just let the facts challenge them. 
Why should your worldview be privileged over theirs? Maybe you should just let the facts and the evidence challenge you as well. Don't you want what they had if it's true? I mean, when they were told, we're going to throw you into this arena, basically we're going to feed you to these lions because of your faith, and they handled it. Man, they sang. They worshiped God as they were being fed to the lions, literally. How in the world is that even possible? You say, well, pastor, we don't even face that kind of stuff today. What are you talking about? We're not facing lions. Yeah, maybe not. But we're facing things like cancer. The doctor says, you have a lump. We're going to have to biopsy it. We don't even know what this means yet. How do you handle it? Don't you want to have the same kind of hope and certainty about the future that they had if it's true so you can handle it? Now listen, here's how they got what they got. It wasn't because of wishful thinking. Uh, they didn't get it by saying, well, wouldn't it be wonderful? I mean, wouldn't it be great if there was this thing called the afterlife? And, and wouldn't it just be wonderful and great if, if, if there was this place called heaven that we could all go to one day and everything would be good? Friends, they didn't get their hope through wishful thinking. They got their hope by looking logically at the evidence and the facts in front of them. They sat down and they said, why would all these people say these things happen? I mean, would this be a hoax? Well, no. You don't die for a hoax, what you know to be a lie. Well, would this be a hallucination? No. I mean, any psychologist and scientist in the world would tell you, hallucinations don't happen in groups. That's impossible. 500 people don't ac accidentally happen to have the same hallucination all at once. They didn't get their hope through wishful thinking. They got their hope through thinking. And you can too. Well, how can I do that, Pastor? Well, <laughs> you could say, if I don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus... And maybe that's you. And again, you're in a safe place to ask those questions and get good answers. But if the only reason you came today is because she invited you or he invited you or, or they invited you, hey, we're going to go to lunch after this, so hey, come with us, right? Maybe they'll give you a Bible or a Starbucks gift card. Come to church. But listen, if you say, I just really don't believe it, I don't believe in the resurrection, right? I just can't accept that, then here's what has to happen. You have to come up with a historically possible alternate explanation for this incredible worldview shift of thousands and thousands of people who said, we saw him. You have to come up with a historically possible alternate explanation for the birth of the Christian church. And do you know what? No one has ever done that. 2,000 years, many thinkers, great ones, and yet nobody's ever come up with that. Think, friends. Let it challenge you. And as you think, if you're willing to be challenged, then the Holy Spirit comes in, and he gives you that hope on the inside. You can have that same certainty that they had. You can face lumps or lions or whatever. Now, here's the second thing. Last one. Write this down, because I just want to focus on the early Christians. I also want to give us something today as well. Here's number two. The resurrection of Jesus Christ describes the hope that we can have for our future. Now, the last part of this passage is just filled with famous verses. There are some that you've probably heard before. I've used many of these at, at funerals. And, and it's just it, it's pretty exciting stuff when we break it down. And I want to share it with you. One commentator writes that there are four um, you know, things that the images at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 tell us that we get to look forward to. And here they are, write these down. Number one, stingless death. The Bible says, oh, death, where is your sting? And do you know that, 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 that word sting in the original language, in the Greek, is actually a very specific Greek word. It's the word kentron. And that word kentron does not just mean a bite or a sting. Listen, it means a poison sting. And you'll get this. You'll totally get this. It was used, it was a word that was used to describe a scorpion sting, right? Uh, which could be lethal, especially in that part of the world. So what's interesting about this image, it's not the bite that kills you in a kentron, is it? It's the poison in the bite. And Paul tells us what the poison in the bite is. He describes it. He says, oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death, and again, when he uses that word sting, he's really meaning the poison or the venom of death, is the law. Now, what is he saying by this? Well, here's what he's saying. He says, 
If we could be totally sure that when we die, it's just extinction. That when we die, it's just annihilation. If we could be totally sure that when we die, we just cease to exist and, and, and that's it, then there would be absolutely no reason at all to be afraid of death. I mean, it would have no poison. It would have no sting. We wouldn't be scared of it as long as we're alive because death isn't there. As soon as we're extinct, what's the fear? What's the problem? There's no problem. But here's what he says. He says, the problem is nobody can be totally sure that death is annihilation. Nobody can be totally sure that when you die, you don't really stand before a holy God who created the universe and have to answer for everything you've ever done in your life. Nobody can be totally sure that there's not a judgment. And because we know it's possible, we're scared. I mean, anybody who's ever faced death or had a a near-death experience knows that your life flashes before your eyes and you suddenly say, I haven't lived the way I should. I'm not ready, right? There's a sense of judgment. And you say, well, pastor, I don't even believe in that. Can you be sure? Are you absolutely certain that if you die, you just cease to exist? Are you absolutely certain that you will not stand before a holy God who created this universe? And as you look around, it's hard to think that there's not a great designer. And are you sure that you won't stand before that holy God who sent his son to save you? Who who thousands of people, eyewitnesses said they saw him risen from the dead and yet you rejected him? You, You think that's not even possible? Are you sure? And Paul says if you can't be sure, that's the poison. That's the poison. That's the venom and the sting in your soul. Therapists, poets, counselors, theologians, philosophers, everybody says we're afraid of death. Right? It's the poison. It's the sting. Now, how are we going to get rid of that sting? Listen, Paul says it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen, what he says is such good news. The gospel comes along and says, okay, you're right. You thought it in your heart of hearts, and it's true. There is a judgment. There is a God who will hold you accountable for the way you've lived. One day you will, when you die, have to stand before him and answer for all that you have done. But here's the good news of the gospel. Jesus took that judgment for you. If you receive Christ, he has taken that judgment for you. Now, how do you know? How do you know Jesus Christ paid the penalty that in your heart of hearts you know that you owe God? Paul says again, the resurrection. Friends, you know what the resurrection is? It's a receipt. It's a God's way of of stamping it is finished, paid in full over all of history. I mean, why do you keep a receipt? You keep a receipt so you can say it's paid for, right? So when you're walking out with all the stuff in your hands and and there's a guy standing at the door and he's looking at you like, where are you going? You go, there's my receipt, right? So you can walk on out with your stuff. The resurrection is the cosmic receipt. And this is what's so amazing about this image. Death is stingless. This is Paul's way of saying death can't really kill you. Death has no poison. Death will bite you, but death can't really kill you kill you. Stingless death. Here's the second image. This is an awesome image as well. Swallowed suffering. Notice what it says about the victory that the resurrection brings over death. It doesn't say death is removed. Now let me talk about that. Here's a good way to explain it. Let's imagine that you have a great big bowl of chocolate ice cream. I'm already excited. Are you? Right in front of you. It's my favorite dessert, yeah. And, and you got this great big bowl of chocolate ice cream there in front of you on the table. There's only two ways to get rid of it, right? You can either throw it out, but who would do that? Or you can eat it. Yeah, you swallow it. And it, then it becomes a part of your energy and your life. It enhances you, sometimes in ways you don't want it to, right? <laughs> Tim Keller writes, the resurrection is not a consolation for suffering. The resurrection is not even a removal of suffering. The resurrection, listen, swallows suffering. Notice it says, we're going to bear the likeness of the man from heaven. It's talking about Jesus. And what do you notice as you read the Bible about the resurrected Jesus? What do you notice? His wounds are still there. He says, look, see my hands, see the nail prints, see the places where the nails were, and look here, my side, see the place where the spear went. We see when we look at the resurrected Jesus that his sorrows are still a part of his glory. 
And so the resurrection doesn't just say, well, here, we're going to take you to heaven and give you a little bit of consolation for that hard life you had to live. That's not heaven. That's not hope. The resurrection says you get to live the life you always wanted. You get to have the body you always wanted. You get to have the family you always wanted. You get to have the love you always wanted. You get to have what you always wanted. And if that's the case, then it means that even the worst things you've ever experienced in the end will only make your joy greater. That's a defeat, man. That's an utter defeat of suffering. That your deepest sorrows you've experienced in this life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, will end up only making your eventual glory and joy greater than it would have been otherwise. That's pretty awesome. Here's number three. We also can look forward to a new physical body. You excited about that one? Yeah, me too. Here's what it says. One of the most interesting things in this passage is where it says in verse 54, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable. And you're like, Dude, when you read that, I had no idea what you're talking about. I was hoping you were going to talk about that. Have no fear. I am. Okay. Traditional religion says, I have a body. It's physical. It's perishable. Someday my soul will be liberated from that body and I'll be okay. That's not what the scripture says at all. It doesn't say that. In many, many places, it, it contradicts that. In fact, it says here that the perishable will put on the imperishable. And this is the most astounding thing. The resurrection hope of Christians is that you're going to get more physical, not less. You say, what in the world are you talking about? You're more physical in the sense that you are solid, man. You're going to last. You're not going to deteriorate. You're not going to shrivel as time goes on. God is going to wipe away, the Scripture says, absolutely everything wrong with this world, all poverty, all suffering, all injustice. Revelation says there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more cancer, no more old age, no more arthritis, no more sore knees, right? You will have a new physical yet perfect forever body. I'm for that. How about you? (laughs) That's a cause for celebration. The great evangelist Dwight L. Moody preached all over the world but led a church, and he also started a Bible institute in Chicago that still bears his name. As he was nearing the last days of his life, he was preaching before a congregation, and he said this, Someday soon you will read in the newspaper that Dwight L. Moody is dead. Don't you believe it? I was born in 1837. I was born again in 1855. When I leave this world, death will not claim me. I will live forever. And friends, that's our promise. That's the hope of Easter, the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what the scripture teaches about our future. Here's the last thing it teaches. One day you will get to experience the true you. Do you realize there's a true self that God created that he intended for you? But we live in a broken and a fallen world where there's all this junk around it, all the sins, all the misunderstandings with people, all the strained relationships, all your fears, all those things your parents gave you that you're trying to get rid of, but you probably never will. (laughs) This is a broken place, not the way God created it originally. And many people are walking around as corpses, like zombies, Not who they were created to be. Dead in their sins, the Bible says. Warren Wiersbe says, when you're spiritually dead, you don't need resuscitation. You need resurrection. Friends, there's a core you. And Paul says, when it's planted in the resurrection body, it will come up. When you get to heaven one day, you will finally be the true you. And that's good news of hope. That's the hope of Easter. That's the hope we have because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that wasn't always what it felt like. Certainly didn't feel like that on Friday. On Friday when his trial and his crucifixion caught his friends and followers by surprise. I mean, they had seen Jesus heal people. They had seen Jesus walk on water. They had even seen him raise the dead. And yet just a few days after he had entered into the holy city as a king and after he had cleansed the temple as a prophet, he was arrested, tried, convicted, executed on a Roman cross as a criminal. And with that, Matthew says, darkness came over all the land. 
And friends, that darkness came over all of them as well. Over their hearts, over their minds, over their spirits. Empty darkness. And maybe you've felt that way. Maybe you feel that way if you're honest today. That there's a darkness over your life. And if that's the case, can I please, please tell you about the hope of Easter. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that was passed down to you by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, without defect. It says, Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that now your faith and your what? Your hope are in God. Friends, again, you have to understand the bad news before you can really appreciate and receive into your life the good news. And here's the deal. Without Christ, we are spiritually dead. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And friends, all means all. That means you, that means me, that means everybody. We're all in the same boat. And then the Bible goes on to say in Romans 6.23 that the wages of that sin is death. And man, that's bad news, isn't it? I I mean, if if that were the end of the story, that, that we are dead in our trespasses and our sins, man, I guess the only logical response would be a state of denial in order for us to move forward and function. But the good news is that's not the end of the story. That's not where the story ended. I love the first two words of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Those two words are, but God. Friends, we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, but God. We were unresponsive and becoming more and more corrupt, but God. All our best efforts had resulted in failures and mistakes, but God. We are being controlled by this world and by evil spiritual forces and by our own inner evil desires and drives, but God. We deserve eternal judgment, but God. Friends, we are dead without Christ. In our sins, the Bible says, but we have been rescued from death. It says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Well, that's good news, isn't it? And maybe you walked in here today with that empty darkness over your life. But you don't have to walk out of here that way. Friends, you can walk out of here today with the hope of Easter. You can walk out of here today with a certainty about your future because of what Jesus has done because he rose from the dead. You don't have to live in darkness. Because when it comes to Jesus, he is our living hope. Great on mercy, what 
seated. You know, we want to thank you so much for being here to, to worship with us today here at Compass for Easter. We're so glad that you were here. The ushers are going to come and pass the offering bags in just a moment here. But as they do that, I want to let you know about a few things before we go here today. One of the things we celebrate every week here at Compass is something called the Dollar Club. And if you don't know, the Dollar Club is where we ask everyone to throw in just one extra dollar on top of what they would normally give in the offering. And then we take the accumulation of all that between all of our services and all of our campuses. We multiply the people that attend those by one dollar and then we give it all away to help somebody in need. This last week's uh, Dollar Club gift went to a gentleman 
who we found out uh, got behind on some bills. He's been out of work due to some medical conditions, got behind on his mortgage. Now, the good news is he was able to find a new job that's going to help him, you know, moving forward, but he still needed some help getting back up on his feet. So we found out about how we could help and uh, stepped in. And because of our Dollar Club gift to them, we were able to pay down bills to the amount of $3,120. So thank you. You know, also, one of the things I love uh, about Compass here is that in the messages, we're not afraid to tackle some of the tougher subjects, to answer questions that people are having. That's why I'm excited to invite you to our next series. It starts next weekend. It's a two-parter. It's called Why. And next weekend, we're going to kick off with one of the toughest whys that people ask, and that is, why is there suffering? Why do bad things happen? So please come and and check that out and see what uh, God's Word has to say to that question. And then the following week, we're going to address just a, a multitude of different types of questions. We'll also have a special event on Facebook Live to address some of these questions. If you have a question that you would like to see answered either on the weekend or on Facebook Live, please text the number that's on the screen behind me and and shoot it to us and uh, we'll be able to respond to that. But our next series is why, so we're excited about that. Also, as Brian mentioned, uh, we're excited on Friday night to go out on Good Friday to our church behind the walls, to you know our campus there in, in Florence, to, to preach to the 130 guys there. We were really excited that 25 guys accepted the invitation to be baptized and accept Christ for the first time. So we want to praise God for that. And just want to let you know that the same invitation is available to you today. So if you're ready to take that step to receive Christ into your life for the first time. We'll have some prayer partners up here at the front, some pastors up here at the front that can help walk you through that decision. Or maybe you're here and you just simply need prayer. We'd love to invite you to come up. We'd love to pray with you here today. Uh, Also, as Brian said, if you're a guest, we just want to welcome you here, say thank you for coming. And we'd love to meet you in the living room, in the lobby, or at one of our new here, Start Here tents. We have a gift for you, a Starbucks gift card. Love to share with you just as a way to say thank you for being here and to welcome you here at Compass. And as we leave here today, let's do what we always do. Let's go out and love God, love people, share Jesus. Thanks for being here. Happy Easter. Easter.